Uh, I'd like, really like to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful workshop on evolution. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. So, uh, so this will be a talk on uh, uh, Close to My Heart, which I've been working on for quite a while, on formulating evolution as a process of learning. And it dates back to before uh, machine learning became so popular. It's not clear whether it's easier or harder to explain now, but anyway, um, here goes. And so generally, the, uh, well, the aims of this approach are, may become clear, but certainly one minimal long-term aim is that uh, at the moment, there's no good theory to explain, even in very rough terms, uh, the speed of evolution. So if you ask someone, why did evolution not take uh, 10 times as much time as the age of the, un of the universe, why it didn't require that, uh, no one can give very good answers. So some rule of thumb, back of the envelope calculations, which are really persuasive to explain why evolution uh, could have taken a shorter time as, as it has, you know, that's, uh, that's still to be done. That's a good aim. So, um, so let's go back in uh, history a little bit. Um, so when Darwin was a student, uh, one uh, re required reading uh, at his university were writings of William Paley, who was a philosopher. And although this is from a different book, so one famous quotation from him is that um, the contri con contrivances of nature surpass the contrivances of art in, com in the complexity, subtlety, and curiosity of mechanism. So he thought, thought nature was much more complex than anything people make, and, uh, um, and he is the archetypal creationist. Okay, he is, he is widely quoted now as the um, best articula articulator of creationism. So Darwin did read all this stuff, and he believed it all. Um, I did not at the time trouble myself about Paley's premises. Taking those on trust, I was charmed and convinced of the long, time, long line of argumentation. So in fact, uh, Paley had been a brilliant math student, um, and so he was uh, interested in this problem of nature looking very complex and finding it implausible that, it, that anything like um, any kind of uh, evolution could have, could have worked. Um, so of course, uh, Darwin did change his mind. We believe that uh, Paley was wrong in his conclusion, but the basic uh, question he raised is still unanswered in that we still have to explain how very complex mechanisms which are very interlocking and work, uh, how in a certain amount of time they can come into existence. So kind of he, his conclusion was wrong, but his questions were, in my view, kind of correct. Um, and so as I said, uh, the time the speed of, of evolution is, is critical. Uh, this was recognized in Darwin's time, so very famously, but there was a 19th century argument where Darwin put, that, put this 300,000 year uh, age down in the first edition of the Origin of Species, which is a guess of how old the Earth, minimum, a low bound on the age of the Earth. Physicists didn't believe it. 19th century physics said the Earth was younger. Big gap worried Darwin. Uh, 21st century, age of the universe has gone up a bit, but um, we still don't have a theory which explains why that, that time is enough. Okay, so um, if uh, evolution was some exponential search, it would take far too much time. We need some, some better theory, and we, and we, we don't have it. Um, okay, so. And uh, of course, the, the uh, missing part is that Darwin wasn't too specific in what his mechanism was. So certainly, you could say that, may, that maybe uh, evolution is uniform independent mutations in the genome. So that may be correct. This may not be, may be incorrect. But whatever your theory of what evolution really is, you also need to explain why this mechanism is enough to explain what we see. Okay? So there's always something missing in whatever one's theory is. Okay, so um, just uh, a couple of more philosophical points. So I'm really interested in Paley's problem, which is to explain uh, why this incredible complexity and innovation which e evolution has provided, how that was possible. So that's really what, what I'm aiming at. But there are many other issues, um, like, like sex, as we've just heard. And uh, so again, one historical uh, curiosity is that, of course, Darwin was a very uh, careful scientist. 
you're trying to exp find explanations for changes in biology. And the first place he went was animal breeding. At the time, there was amazing stuff in two or three generations to change what animals looked like. Um, but in fact, now we know, or I think we know, is that these two things are, are very different. So in animal breeding, uh, there's no innovation. You just uh, mix uh, uh, genes up. Whereas uh, clearly, if you want all the innovation we have, um, it's not believed that just recombination is enough. You need some novelty, uh, mutations, or whatever. So uh, uh, Darwin may have just kind of blundered okay, in thinking these are the same. But his, uh, if it was a blunder, it had long, uh, long consequences. Um, so certainly, um, there became a very detailed study of genetic mixing, sex, statistics, Fisher Wright. And so Artie gave a very good explanation of th this tradition. Um, but I think this is rather different from the left-hand side, and it's more different than people uh, think. Um, so when uh, once I, a while ago I gave this talk to some audience of these right-hand side people, I got this question from the audience basically saying, well, look, we, we already have a theory. Why do we need another theory? Um, and I didn't have a good answer at that time. <laughs> But the answer I should have given is that, uh, uh, no, you don't have a theory. I mean, you have a good uh, right-hand side theory. Um, and in fact, uh, the theory, which I think Artie described, is usually called population genetics, uh, whatever the names are. But it's, it's usually not called evolution, OK, it's traditionally. Uh, evolutionary theory is a much more general, informal thing. So we do need something on the left. and, and uh, no, we don't have a, new, a good name, so I've used evolvability, but some others have used that for different purposes already. So, um, but uh, you know, I'll try to characterize what uh, I think are needed on the, on the left-hand side. Um, so, uh, okay, so again, one more general thing, which this will emphasize is that, um, so the word fitness, uh, survival, survival of the fittest. So it goes back to Spencer, Darwin uh, adopted it. Uh, so my understanding of the f original phrase was that fitness is kind of some characteristics you have in your life which makes you have many descendants, like a, you're strong or thin or something. Um, but soon, again, as uh, Adi showed, uh, fitness became defined by the statisticians as just the number of descendants. Okay, so the phrase survival of the fittest became a bit of a tautology. Um, but uh, you know, so for my purposes, I need to separate the two. And just to avoid confusion, so, um, so I have a notion called uh, performance, which um, is, I think, a measure of fitness in which Spencer and Darwin may, may have meant it. Um, OK. So, um, OK, so one advantage we have over these early people is that we kind of know what evolution is at one level. So we got all these uh, genes expressing proteins, and uh, presumably each gene expresses a protein differently under different uh, conditions. And, uh, and what we'd be interested in is that if, you, if you've got, let's say, the seventh gene, seventh protein, then your, this gene will express this protein according to some quantity, expression level, and presumably it depends on some conditions. So conditions may be what other proteins are floating in your cell, it, it, it's not constant for all time. Okay, so there's an expression function. Your genome does something. It expresses proteins. And furthermore, in some sense, if you simplify biology, this is what biology is. Biology is defined by a set of genes which express proteins under different conditions. Okay, so evolution is a, these things which are evolving. So that's what we have to explain. Um, and, and generally, uh, the kind of the conundrum we're in is that if these functions are very complex, then uh, you won't, they won't be able to navigate the, the um, evolutionary space. We need algorithms which navigate uh, uh, the evolutionary space. On the other hand, if these functions are too simple, then uh, there's no biology. You know, if, uh, um, if every protein depends on just one, one other protein from day one, it's not enough. OK. Um, OK, so let me know. Okay, so, um, so again, just to differentiate from the statistical view, the statistical view, uh, each genome is assigned a fitness, and then somehow the, how these fitness, fitnesses mix, and 
whatever happens on the recombination that's studied. Um, but uh, for us, we need to say a bit more about fitness. We need to define it. And um, so generally, the idea is that uh, what you do, your g genes, this is expression function. So under different conditions, you express a gene differently. And this function uh, needs a definition. The, sorry, the performance needs a definition. OK. Um, so the idea is that you know, if you believe in you know, survival of the fittest means what we do influences, is important, influences uh, whether we have descendants. So, I mean, if you believe, if you're serious, you need to quantify it. You need to give some definitions. And, uh, okay, and what we'll do, I'll say this a few, a few times. So the idea will be that th this G is your current uh, genome's effort. And to see how well it's doing, it'll compare itself with some F, which is the best possible behavior. Um, so under every condition, you know, if you do A, it's so good. If you do B, maybe it's better. Okay, so, you know, so if you talk about fitness, it must be that you're evaluated for, your, for what you do. Um, so we'll compare what you do with your best possible thing. And there's also a distribution. There are different conditions don't have all the same probability. Um, you know, some, some conditions are much more frequent than others. And then we'll analyze algorithms which, which mutate your genome to become better um, sorry, that should be an, uh, a G. Okay. So, okay, so that's the general view. Okay, so set in a different language. Um, so what I think has to be different on, on the left-hand side theories is that we're giving more meaning to this fitness landscape. Okay, so these fitness uh, landscape diagrams have been around for 100 years, but the big mystery to me always is uh, what do the axes mean? Okay, that's, okay so... Okay, so I've, I've heard one talk by evolutionary biologist who, who said that uh, he's never seen a fitness landscape where the axes were defined. Okay, so that's, a, that's an exaggeration, but <laughs> okay. Um, so the horizontal axis is some, some, so, somewhat in, uh, in genome space, clearly, in genotype space, but at least even then you have to say um, that you're moving around. It's, the, it's an evolutionary algorithm which moves you around. So it doesn't only make sense if you have an evolutionary algorithm, okay? Um, but the harder part is what's the, what's the vertical uh, axis mean? And don't just say it's the number of your descendants because that's we're trying to, to describe uh, fitness in terms of uh, your attributes other than the number of descendants uh, so that you can then relate the two, okay? Again, so repeating what I said before, so in each situation C, which could be a concentration of your proteins in your cell, um, there is a most beneficial action. Maybe there are many of the equal benefits, and we call the benefit V. Um, but your particular genome uh, maybe outputs your thing a different amount. Instead of two units, it outputs three units. So that has a different benefit, which is suboptimal. B prime, okay? And then we have to say how much worse you are off. So the vertical axis will be a measure of how good your genome is. And what it is, it's some measure or some penalty which penalizes you for the difference between the benefit of what you do, uh, what you do and what the best thing to do is. It's some function, okay, we'll have flexibility in that. It's always weighted by the probability of this situation. So, you know, there's some very frequent situations in the world, some rare situations, and you know, you only have to do well in, in the frequent situations you encounter. This is uh, very, uh, comes from learning theory. Okay. Um, okay. So we can be very general as far as distributions. We want to work for a very broad class of distributions, and the other issue is that we also want to work for a broad class of penalty functions. So the examples I use is that, you know, uh, if you drink, say, say, coffee, there's an optimal amount of coffee to drink a day. If you drink too much or too little, uh, there's a penalty. But you know, who are we to legislate what the penalty is? And so we need an evolution algorithm which is very flexible for different metrics. Okay. Okay. So that's the. Uh, 
general idea. So, so the uh, each, each G, G genome gene or will have a, a function associated with it, which is itself some integral over its behavior in all, all, all situations. And it's penalized, it figures out how far you, you are from optimal behavior. Um, of course, all this optimal behavior stuff, you know, who knows? No one knows what it is. But the whole point is that no one needs to know. Um, so, okay, so now let's answer the, maybe the most obvious uh, uh, question. Um, so well, how can we talk about this setup if we are so ignorant about uh, biology? Okay, so I'm discussing the benefit of a genome to, in, in biology. And after all, the benefit depends on, on your connection between the genotype and phenotype and also the environment. So, so if we don't understand all this stuff, how can we have a theory of this? Okay, so this is kind of the main, main question. But the answer is uh, no problem uh, because, um, okay, so what we're claiming is that, um, so we have some protein concentration up there. Um, Um, and we know that uh, through, through some very complicated stuff we don't understand, the protein concentration uh, maps to some, to some benefit. Um, okay, so that's, that should, I suppose that should be, uh, it, yeah, okay, so it's the expression level which has the best benefit, okay, uh, for a given concentration. Um, how much should you express? How, how active should the gene be to, to most get the most benefit? And the benefit is some very complicated rela relation, okay, which we don't, no one knows about. And what we're going to do is we're going to have an evolution algorithm which guesses various functions, and hopefully these functions get better and better so they do express uh, your protein in an optimal way. Okay, so, um, okay, so you get a picture. So you've got some real cell conditions in your cell, um, and there's some optimal behavior for your gene, and what the optimal behavior actually is, is who knows what, certainly beyond the knowledge of the, of the gene, but this evolutionary algorithm will still try to improve this. Improve this. Okay, so how is this possible? Um, well, um, First simplification is that, you know, instead of all that, you just say very complicated relationship. Okay, that's an improvement. Um, the second thing you do is that you imagine machine learning. So then you say, well, um, this uh, expression function G will just be something, oops, which um, is like a classifier function, except it will, okay be like a machine learning uh, hypothesis, and it'll keep improving through a learning algorithm. And, uh, okay, so then we, uh, you, uh, this looks like the picture of machine learning, where you've got a picture, X, you want to determine whether it's an elephant, the relationship between pictures and, and, and when it's an elephant is very complicated, no one has a theory of how to, how to do that. But nevertheless, the machine learning algorithm can do the classification. Okay, so we draw an exact analogy. Um, of course, in, in, in learning, there's a supervisor who points, who gives you examples and points to what's an elephant or not. In evolution, it's exactly the same. So who, who points down there? Um, So what's the feedback in evolution? Yeah, 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 so well, survival, life or death, okay? So the world tells you, so if you're expressing badly, you, you're gonna die, okay? So, um, but otherwise it's, it's exactly the same. Um, okay, so it's, okay, so you can, uh, okay. So of course for anything, to, for machine learning to, to work, as for evolution, you can't do arbitrarily, arbitrary, uh, mappings, okay, so, but even if you don't understand it, so it's, this is the uninterpretable, uh, you'll be able to 
learn it through some other uninterpretable uh, uh, fu function. Okay. Okay. So, any problems with, with this? Okay. So that's that's. Sorry, the. Well, its, it's benefit is. Uh, well, so you, you've got your, your genome in your cell, and it faces various concentrations of chemicals, and it has to know what to do. Right, but that we ignore. We don't need that to know that. Okay, so it still needs to. Um, okay, so so we we'll ignore that. Okay, so okay, but okay. So the main point is still is that uh, it's, you you won't be able to um, evolve arbitrary functions just like you can't learn arbitrary arbitrary, arbitrary fun functions either. You can only learn functions which are easy in some sense, and that's all anyone's learning. Um, Okay, so um, okay, um, okay. So um, so what we're studying is the kind of what's learnable, what's evolvable, as far as these expression levels. So maybe the expression level of a gene is some function of the concentrations of C1 and C2. Is some function? We don't know what it is. We're trying we're trying to learn it, and we're trying to see whether it can. Uh, evolve into existence without a designer uh, using machine learning. Um, okay, so machine learning. Okay, so you all know what that is, so we'll skip that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. But uh, if you know what machine learning is, so this is the correspondence that the hypothesis in the machine learning corresponds to the genome. The examples for machine learning algorithm are the experiences. It's like concentrations of chemicals in your, in your cell. So your learning algorithm will basically be a me mechanism of variation. So which means, you know, given this generation, what are the options for the next generation? Okay, so that, that's the evolution algorithm, which Darwin didn't tell us. We have to figure out. Um, we have to figure out whether there is a, a plausible one. And then the feedback is, is just is survival. Um, it's feedback from the environment. It's, it's some organisms live and some die. So this is all pretty straightforward, I hope. Um, okay, just one comment. So a learning algorithm is something like the perception algorithm, where you learn a linear separator. And uh, if you know the perception algorithm, given examples, you update the hypothesis by adding to the coefficients or subtracting from the coefficients. Okay, so one default theory would be that maybe our evolution algorithm uh, is the perception algorithm. Okay, so perhaps your, your cell will, um, will produce the, the, its protein according to a condition like this, um, where X and Y and Z are, are concentrations of, of chemicals. And then we update this according to an individual experience. Okay, so, so why is this absurd? So why is this not Darwinian evolution? This is already far too strong for Darwinian evolution because, well, because it's very Lamarckian, okay? So you're saying that based on a single experience, a single example, you change your genome, okay? Darwin says it doesn't happen. Okay? From a single experience, you can't go and change your genome. All you can do, if you have a genome, all you can do is for the next generation, you generate some other genomes and see which one works in the world. So these Darwinian machine learning algorithms will be very con uh, restricted in, in that sense. Okay. Um, okay, so I won't give a formal definition, but basically this is what you have to put together. Um, so the a Darwinian machine learning algorithm is one where you make a variant of your current genome independent of the, of the examples. If you use examples, that would be Lamarckian. And you set, let them out in the world and each one can kind of see how it does. And it's the performance of, the, uh, of each of these uh, genomes, you, which goes out in the world, which compete by selection. Um, also, um, this model uh, aims to be re realistic. 
in that the performance of a genome won't be its exact theoretical performance. I mean, no one knows these ideal functions. It will be some empirical approximate approximation. And it has a thousand experiences, so it takes some, so you get a mean value of the, of the ideal, of the performance, okay. Um, okay, um, okay, so we're trying to, uh, there is some ideal function uh, up there in the sky, and we try to, uh, this algorithm tries to improve itself. Uh, there's no claim that you get to the ideal. I mean, as the world changes, you're happy just to be able to keep your head above water and try to go in the right direction. Okay, so just going, seeing what the right direction is next is good enough. Um, to get a definition, um, the other two things I want to mention is that you want the mechanism by which the next generation is produced from, 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 from the current one to be computationally feasible. So certainly allowing random mutations at the point, no problem, copying, um, Bits of, t bits of your genome somewhere else, no problem, because they're all easy, easy computations. So in the model, we allow anything which is an easy, uh, 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 viable computation. And the reason we can do this is that even this doesn't help us very much. So, so what we're trying to do is to find you know, possible interesting mechanisms evolution could be using, and we keep an open mind. We don't legislate on what uh, we think biology happens to be doing. Okay, but, okay. And the fourth one is that we keep, uh, keep this honest. You know, population sizes are limited. Number of generations you're allowed is limited. Number of experiences, individual amount, individuals limited. Okay, so you make up a, um, a, a model like this. Sorry? Um, well, um, um, but po polynomial in the, uh, yes, yeah, so, so say, say in the, um, in the length of description of, 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 of the gene, say, okay, so even if you have, this works even for, for one gene, okay, okay, yeah. so, so, how much time do I have, sorry, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay, so what one can make up a definition out of this. Okay, so again, uh, saying about the same thing again. Um, okay, so what are we really doing? So supposing uh, each vertical line is a different protein concentration, okay? So uh, uh, first column says the first uh, protein and zero means that it's absent in your cell, okay? So a row means a critical instant. So in a row, you're told which proteins are present. So at each time, you've got some different pattern of proteins. But, uh, so the point is that um, this, a gene sees this, and presumably the gene has to do, you know, shouldn't do the same thing every time. Under some conditions, it should do something, X, like express, and under condi other conditions, it should do nothing, which is why, okay? So there are no assumptions here. This is, uh, this is so far, it's just, just biology, okay? Um, but the kind of issue we're looking at is that, let's see uh, what, what are the conditions which differentiate X and Y, okay? And so it's, it so happens that uh, the example I've given, um, if you've got a, odd number of ones in the, in the three blue columns, you should do X. If you have an even number of ones in the blue columns, you should, you should do Y. That, that's a, a function which uh, your gene may be uh, controlled by, okay? Um, so, um, so the idea is that your gene must be controlled by some function. Could be a Boolean function, linear function, uh, complicated function, it must be some function. And furthermore, your evolution algorithm must be able to navigate these different functions, okay? It must go from this function to another function in the class um, if, if evolution, uh, if the conditions change, okay? So the typical example I gave, which is the odd or evenness, is in fact one which we can prove, which, which we can prove is impossible to evolve, 
Okay, so some functions are impossible to evolve. So it's a mathematical result using this model, which I haven't, uh, haven't totally uh, defined. So the fact that biologists have never heard of the parity function is good because it's a theorem that they, <laughs> it doesn't happen, okay? Um, okay, so, um, so there's some uh, uh, earlier results. So if the function is an or, it's, it's whether at least one of three different uh, proteins is present, those things are evolvable in this Darwinian model. If it's an uh, uh, odd number parity, then it's provably not. Okay, so uh, this one depends on the result of my Kearns on statistical queries. The first one is an algorithm. So both theorems apply for uniform distribution. And in fact, the first one uh, is known not to be true for all distributions. So in, in machine learning, we want results, we like results which are true universally for all distributions. This one is, is rather weaker. Okay, but this is what we hope to do. We, we don't know which, what class of functions biology is able to track, and we can prove mathematically that some are easy and some are, some are hard. And among the easy ones, we should uh, figure out which ones are being used. Okay, so uh, just to emphasize that, uh, the, what's hard is to discover the subset on which oddness is important. Okay, so if uh, oddness on the whole set is easy, but if you don't know what, what subset is important where you have to choose the oddness, that's what's hard to discover. And again, for computer scientists, so this is exact noise-free learning, and in the general learning model, you can do this, but in the Darwinian model, you cannot. Okay, um, so there's various uh, results one can prove. Um, so there are good reasons for going to real valued functions. Um, and uh, so one question is, what are the functions you're evolving? Another question is, when you penalize yourself for being wrong, what kind of penalt penalties, penalties do you allow yourself? And uh, so for at least three different things you could, you could look at. Um, and, uh, okay, and as I was saying, uh, a, a big aim here is eventually to come out and be able to give a, to convince my, me, for example, that you have a plausible argument for why evolution could have happened in the time available. Um, so for example, we know that there are perhaps 50, 60 mutations per individu individual human, but the ones which are important are, are rather rare so, for example, this lactose intolerance mutation is always regarded as the one really important one, which has happened in the last 10,000 years. Okay. So, um, okay, what do we have here? Okay, so, um, so if, you, if you want to explain why evolution could, could have happened in this time available, the, you know, the usual problem is that if you, if you look at some optimization method, which takes a long time, it's kind of plausible, implausible that all these things happen or well, the sequence of good things happened in the right order, and that's what we have to explain. But there are two, generally two classes of things you can do. So uh, one class is to look for algorithms which could work on big moves. So what's a big move? So one big move is that a gene can be disabled by a single mutation. You don't have to w wait for a long se sequence of unlikely events to happen. A single mutation can change things. That's a big move. And there are also mo mobile ele elements, which again, a big move. You can move a chunk of your DNA somewhere else. Um, and so there's some chance of explaining evolutionary algorithms using these big moves. And the ones you're like likely to explain are those which are discrete. Um, so, uh, so I have an algorithm for conjunctions. And basically, um, the moves the algorithm needed all applied to, with appropriate probabilities is that if you believe that um, to express your protein, these three proteins have to be present, then your evolution algorithm would have to be able to do three th one of three things. One is to add an, add, a, add an extra condition. Another one is remove a condition. Another one is just to swap a condition. Um, okay, so the question is whether you can um, um, implement this kind of evolutionary algorithm using big moves, as I've described. Okay, so it's not so clear, but I think that's a good question. And so just, uh, 
Um, to, to finish, I'll just go to the other extreme of, of real valued uh, functions, which, uh, okay, where there are lots of results. Okay, so, let, so let's just uh, uh, say this in less formal terms. And again, I'll, I'll redefine everything I've said in the, in the first, last slide. So if you've missed anything I've said, I'm repeating everything. Okay, so, um, okay, so in this real valued uh, evolution, um, I've translated it from cell expression to uh, behavior. Okay, so you consume a certain amount of alcohol, and the idea is that there's an ideal amount to consume per day, which is two minus two x plus three y, where maybe x is your age and y is your weight. Okay, so it's some um, function. Uh, that's the ideal, and uh, actually your your behavior is the is the other expression. Okay, I'm just translating from. Uh, cells to alcohol consumption. Um, so then the theory says that um, uh, this isn't optimal, so, so you must be penalized somehow. Um, okay. And so for example, if the penalty may be that you cube the difference between uh, how much you consume and uh, what the ideal consumption is. And again, then, then the meaning will be that, say, for the alcohol part, um, for every uh, condition, you take the difference of the, um, what you consume and what, what the ideal would be, you give yourself some penalty function, maybe, cube, may, may, maybe something else, and then you integrate over all possible conditions. So the evolving, the, so what's evolving, the, what's kind of, uh, what you're optimizing, what the evolving uh, fitness thing is, is this integral, integral over, uh, overall conditions of, uh, of your penalty, okay? Um, now, it so happens that, uh, in fact, we don't have one, one gene. We have lots of genes, and we're optimizing over the space of 20,000. So, in fact, our loss, our performance, is some function of them all. So, supposing you also have a penalty function for a second cell, which is your coffee consumption. So, maybe that's your penalty. The question is, can you, is there an evolution algorithm which can uh, um, kind of roll down the hill and uh, you know, find the ideal function? Um, and again, so the model is that this is your loss function, this is your performance, and uh, you know, so you don't, the ideal function is hidden from you, that's, no one knows what the ideal behavior is. But um, somehow you're penalized by how far you, off you are in individual, for individ, individual values of x and y. So what you really get is some approximate uh, approximation to the integral. Okay. Okay. So you you go through life and you accumulate all the penalties for having dr drunk the wrong amount. Okay. That's that's your penalty. And with that, is there some hope of of uh, evolving? So. Uh, okay, so this is Paul Valiant. So he had one result which said that um, you could evolve uh, in, a, in a strong distribution-free sense now, but better than my previous one, um, if, you're, if the function you're uh, evolving is a set of basically polynomials. Um, so you know, if you take uh, if your penalty is from constant power and your um, well, okay. Um, so you, uh, well, you have to develop a, a representation for the function. So the evolution algorithm has a representation for this problem. Um, well, any rule is computable. You can do whatever you, you can do. Any, you can do whatever you like. But the only information you have is, is this noisy oracle function. Okay, so you develop. It's like a learning algorithm. You develop a representation, and anything is allowed for the representation. Okay. Um, um, so this is a good result because it applies to the general class of natural functions. It's distribution free, and uh, it works for if loss functions are convex. All convex loss functions. So it's pretty general in that. Okay. Um, so in fact, it's, uh, it can also be improved. Um, so there's some uh, loss functions which aren't uh, convex. So for example, square root isn't convex. Root two thirds isn't convex, um, so this is not convex. 
nor if you try to deal with any power of it. Um, but these functions are called uh, star convex. So if you raise polynomials with fractional powers, um, okay, so star convex means that, um, so convex means that you can always go downhill. To, uh, uh, so star convex means that, um, okay, so convex means that between any points on the surface you can see each other. Uh, star convex means that there's one minimum point which everyone can see. Okay, so in this formulation, the zero point everyone can see, uh, but of course no one knows where, where it is. Um, and so, so this is our optimization problem which also arises, which was motivated by evolution. So in fact this uh, optimization method also works for these star convex functions. So, so in real life, so different cells of yours or different bad habits you have may have different penalty functions and uh, if the penalty functions are kind of close to convex, then, you know, then evolution can navigate them. So they, you know, the, these are not convex if you, if you do a combination of those two, but uh, there are optimization met methods which, which can get around them. Okay, so this is, um, so this is the real valued uh, evolution where you know, there are good uh, theoretical algorithms but uh, again, there's a gap between knowing what uh, real biology can do in, in one step. Okay, so very briefly, um, so there are many interesting issues in evolution which I have nothing to say about except that, you know, these are kind of a corollaries to evolution. I'm asking the more basic question of how is evolution possible at all to get complex things. Um, so there are other approaches to um, trying to solve the same problem of saying that evolution, that the evolution is very, looks as if it's doing miraculous things, but maybe there are other ways you can explain it away, epigenetics, the Baldwin effect. Um, so these are all interesting alternative approaches, um, but so my main view to that is that, so with the, each of these approaches, which is usually kind of informal, um, one should uh, try to formalize it and see whether the class you get is say, equivalent to my ev evolution model or maybe more powerful, so it could be. I mean, it depends how you formalize epigenetics. So it may be that if you formalize it one way, you get you know, full Lamarckian learning, uh, maybe a more plausible way you get the same as I get, maybe the intermediate classes. Um, but any theory you have, you could try to for formalize as some sort of learning model and see, see, and see what its power is. Um, Okay, so uh, okay, so lastly, essence is that um, look, uh, Darwin's uh, um, theory of variation and natural selection is already computer science because it says that evolution works on some general logical principles, uh, and he doesn't mention anything about biology, physics, chemistry, ecology, or anything like that. So he's already says, well, look, look for some logical principles independent of implementation, and this is what computer scientists do. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So thank you. Thank you.